some fucking wolfing to get here. You got good hair. Ain't you mixed? That's what they say, man. I am mixed. What are you mixed with? White and African. Oh. Well, I I guess I was saying because I I probably use the term good hair, which I, I love natural hair, straight up. So I hate to use good hair because people then feel like, if I don't have it's loaded, it's, good, it's, it's you know what I mean? Yeah, it's but, politically loaded for sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Put the mic a little bit closer. Good. Check, check, check. Mic yeah. check. Yeah. Just gonna check it. Sorry. Khalif one two. Yeah, but but yeah. So also. On those sites, it would tell you, you could post your head and it would tell you what grade of hair you have. So it'd be like, yo, you need to get this brush. I'm telling you, it was like a size. Oh, wow. You get this brush, you're going to have to like train your hair for this long. You got to wear the do rag, make sure you don't blah, blah. I'm telling you, man. Wave science. For real. Till I, I realized, I'm like, yo, this is like, they even had a schedule on where you could wash your hair, man. Like, it was just too much. I'm like, dog. I feel like I'm like a slave to the. To, to Damn, niggas with spinners ain't washing their hair out here. No, no, you can do it every day. <laughs> <laughs> like you can't be conditioning your hair every day because it's, it's. Remember, you got to get the curls to lay down. So when you do all that, you going back and forth. Now the curls standing up. You gotta. It was no, I'm not process, gonna lie man. to you though. Actually though, because as a kid, it was like I couldn't tame my shit. So I never really had the spinners. It was like they was. I used to call them tsunamis. You know what I mean? Because. The waves was too large. I couldn't figure them out. Then I had no waves when I cut my dreads off. And uh, it was this Puerto Rican nigga, man. Really? Shout out to my nigga, Jay. This nigga was like, man, I'm finna give you a wave treatment. Yeah. I was like, bro, what is that, <laughs> gang? He did a process with some heat, some certain kind of brush, yeah, yeah. some like, you know, some product or some shit. And uh, I went to the studio after that shit. We was out, we was out uh, in L.A., man. I went to the studio with Chance and them, and I was like, bro, I just did a wave treatment. They was like, nigga, you still ain't got no waves. <laughs> but the next couple days, my shit got on spin. I ain't know what happened. I was like, damn. This what the nigga, fuck did he do? I don't know, bro. It was a wave treatment. He put me under one of those, like, Oh, oh, it was okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was in a real barbershop, you know, and they had a female, like, hair uh-huh. stylist in there, too. And um, Puerto Rican nigga, man. No, he's Dominican. Dominican nigga named Jay. Yeah, Dominican nigga will hook your hair up. I swear to God. I'm going to be honest. Before, it, this is how heavy I used to be into waves. I used to, uh, my nickname, I kid you not. You're going to laugh. And it's really, you know, salute to the OG Max B was Silver Surfer. I was like, my shit's, my shit's so wavy. He's like, Silver Surfer. That's my nickname, dog. I, I almost went with that until I'm like, yo, come on, man. <laughs> yo, snap back to reality. Free man. Max B, bro. Nah, free Max I B. I swear to God, bro. Max B is like, Max B is one of those rare niche artists, as we were speaking about. Yeah, yeah. That was really able to carve that space in an era before artists could really do that. You know what I mean? Max B was not like a mainstream commercial uh, artist in that way, but like Max B has this legend status and through his mixtapes, he honestly, he gave so many things to the game too. Like he gave that sing hook style to Wiz Khalifa, which Wiz has obviously acknowledged and given him his flowers for, you know, bringing French Montana into this shit. But a lot of these sing rap hooks, like Max B was one of the first to fucking yeah, nah, he has, perfect that he shit. He was the hook master for real. I mean, shit, I think even when, you know, he was collaborating with the with Dip, Dipset, that's what they really had him for. Like, yo, like, I remember he was on one of the hooks for like a Jay-Z this, and even though I love Jay, I was like, yo, Max Big Avell, yo, this is Big Avell. Yo, he was the epitome of what, like, swag was, man. And I'm gonna be honest, you see, back that, at that time, I just remember people just had like a real hard line of pain on him. There was so many people like, yo, this dude is trash. Or people like, this it. guy is just the most amazing thing. There was nobody who listened to his music and they were like, yo, he's all right. I've never heard it because he was so creative and he would, it, it was clear he was making his music so different from what was going on. It was impossible for you to be like, oh, it's cool. Like you couldn't, you couldn't just like, just say it was like, 
decent. I never heard somebody hate Max B, but I feel like I was around niggas that appreciated swag. So mm. if you ain't had no swag, you probably wouldn't fuck with Max B. Now Max B was the guy, man. Yo, listen, welcome to another episode of Off the Record Podcast. Ah, this is an episode that I've been waiting for a long time coming. Um, recently seen this individual, you know, on a few other platforms, but I was definitely drawn to trying to initiate and trying to get a conversation going on with them. You know, what is this life if we're not about growing, learning, and, um, you know, just trying to advance forward, whether it's ideas, us, ourselves as, uh, as people. And, um, you know, as the story goes, some people may be like, no, the story as, hey, you guys had a altercation or had a, you know, a dust up or whatever. But that's why it's so beautiful where as we grow in life, we get a chance to kind of step back from some of those moments and kind of just realize like, hey, yo, some of this stuff is ain't about nothing. And also, sometimes you get to have a better understanding later on of what someone was was saying and while when the egos and everything else is put aside. Um, I am very happy to have Vic Mensa on Off the Record. Welcome, my brother. Appreciate you for having me, man. Yes, sir. Now, I'm glad to have you here, man. Um, Recently, I, I was just, I, I've been watching you. I've, I mean, I've always been watching you, but I've been watching you recently. I'm like, yo, I'm like, hip hop, I feel sometimes shuns individuals that tries to grow. Um, I, I've, I've had my own personal, you know, you know, bouts with it too, where sometimes even my own audience is like, yo, we like the most immature version or we like the earlier version. Um, and as time goes on, I'm like, you know what, man, some of the stuff, you know, I've had like a long enough career now where I can look back and I'm like, hey, listen, in hindsight, that should have been curved. I should have done that. Um, yeah, maybe I, I felt at a point here, but I handled it wrong. And hip hop sometimes is ego built, so it's hard to kind of have those conversations. So to even be sitting here with you now, um, I remember our infamous conversation and um, you know, what I think people don't realize, which this is what I took away from it. You know, there was a point you were trying to make that I probably wasn't receiving at that point because I was also fighting my own battles with accountability. And in those, in that moment, it would probably came off as frustrating, right? And you reacted the way you did. I reacted and then the rest became kind of history. But um, I I'll bring you back to that moment a bit. Mm -hmm. You know, in all honesty, I was coming from a place of pain, man. Like mm -hmm. Trey 57, um, who I knew as Nigel that I grew up with, um, you know, he went in the direction that he did and he became a drill artist and he was always gang banging. And when he passed away and I learned about it on your platform the next day and, you know, it was peppered with certain judgments and insults. I was just hurt. I was like, man, you know, this is somebody who I remember. I remember Nigel's moms used to... Um, <laughs> She used to iron his karate outfits. We did karate together. And she used to iron his karate outfits. I was actually with my girl last week at the park in Chicago, in Hyde Park, looking at the exact spot where we fought when I fought him, you know, and we wrestled. And so when, when his life ended in that way, beyond, you know, being hurt because I had lost a friend, I was also doubly hurt in the way that you publicized it. So I was holding on to that shit. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I get it. I get it. I was holding on to that shit before you got a show. Really? <laughs> I definitely was, bro. That shit was on me, bro, because I was like, man, this is my nigga. He just. Mm, 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 mm. I can you imagine know? that too. It was like, and I was, so I, I was stewing in that shit for sure. You know what I mean? And so. When I came on the show, it was like, you know, it was bound to go only one direction. You know what I'm saying? I, I think I, <laughs> I thought about it a million times. So I said, I think I introduced it in a way that 
that obviously I was oblivious to, to that particular situation um, in terms of like what you cared about and what was upsetting you. But I was like, all right, let's just talk about Chicago now. And, and I think you're like, yo, we can't even talk about this without <laughs> me getting this off my chest. Man, you know, I think that as people with a platform in hip hop, and this applies to me entirely, it is our responsibility to treat that with reverence. So when you have a voice and you have the ability to impact, we have to craft a new path, a new narrative than the one of exploitation that has been set forth by the powers that be. They've always taken our culture and exploited it and pitted us against each other and our pain and profited from it. I mean, shit, that's how hip hop landed in the spot where it's at today is because people realized this is a money maker for these young black men to keep killing each other. And so I think like being in Chicago at the time when the Warren Chirac uh, podcast or Warren Chirac YouTube series was going on, you know, it was just hurtful because we're experiencing this in real time and we're losing our loved ones. And at the same time, somebody that is one of us, you know what I mean? A, a, a black person is playing the role that feels to us like, man, he don't even seem to recognize we're going through something real, you know? It seems like he's exploiting our pain. But you know what the, the, the reality is that it's like, we all gotta take a step back and look and see how are we replicating the exploitative structures that have been given to us. Like bad news sales, we know that. You know what I mean? Negative music sales, drug abuse content sales. This is just the truth, man. But there's a quote by a writer I love named Audre Lorde where she says, we can't dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. Mm. And I think that's something we all gotta understand because in my position, I'm like on a completely different foot. I started off making straight conscious music, you know? Like everything was about like love and black power and just introspection. And then when I got some money, First thing I started doing was making disrespectful ass music, you know what I'm saying? Like, why is that though? Like, literally, I, I honestly think it's layered. On one level, you look and you see what music is making money, you know? You see what music is on the radio. It's gonna be disrespectful ass music. And add to that the fact that in my position, well, shit, I was making this uplifting conscious music when I didn't have anything. And then once I got something, now I'm the only person in my orbit with something. So now I'm a target for the people that know me and the people that don't know me. So quickly that becomes resentment. You know, I get backdoed and robbed by some of my best friends and, mm. you know, and I cross the line and now I'm carrying pistols and catching gun cases, all shit I never thought I was going to do when I, I was like. Seeing, so, so you're kind of describing you getting almost, or you noticing maybe now how you were changing as a person after you've gotten some success knowing where you came from. I'm wondering, in the middle of it, are you kind of understand, like, when you have to now really decide, like, you know what, man, shit is real out here, man. I got to tow the pistol. I got to bring a pistol with me just to make sure I'm good. Now you're getting in trouble for that later on, this and third. Are you kind of realizing, like, this shit is changing me fundamentally? You know, I think my ego was so inflamed that even if I did recognize that I was being changed, I also wasn't in a space to take responsibility for anything. So I felt like, Nigga, you made me do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like your actions, the actions of the world, the ways I've been treated, they've pushed me to this point, mm. you know? And as a young person, man, it's, it's, it's hard to grasp the fact that you do have a decision, a choice to make. You know what I mean? That regardless of your circumstances or the cards you've been dealt, you can make a decision to uplift and overcome those circumstances. And I think that 
that just comes in time, man. You know, that's why we able to sit here today. That's like one of the main themes in my new album is a theme of redemption because I got to a space where it was Juice World Day a couple years ago and I'm just meditating on it. And, you know, I used to fear as the years passed. And this one, it was like me growing past 27. 27 Club, Die Young was always a motif in my music. And something I sung about, something I really internalized. Something that you feared or something that you were, you feel like you were almost speaking into existence? Speaking into existence, we romanticized this shit, you know? And so I'm spitting that in my raps, I'm singing about, you know, my addiction, my depression. And when I passed that threshold, I just realized, man, I have to be so grateful. I could be nothing but grateful because so many young artists don't get the opportunity to make that mistake of singing and speaking into existence this worst outcome. And they pass away, age 21, age 22. How many rappers are we seeing fall victim to this? And you listen to the music, and it's not like they didn't prophesize in the way that Tupac illustrates in his documentary. We as artists have to be mindful of the words we speak because your words alone have a resonant frequency. Now add in music. There's a reason why every religion they worship through song. So you putting this in a song and you multiplying the chances it's gonna come back. So when I passed that, I just was awash with gratitude and I was like, oh shit, I just dodged a bullet because I was really Ooh. speaking that bullet into existence. And I'm like, man, Something's got to give, you know? I need to shift my perspective from whatever it is into being gratitude. That's, that's very loaded. So a few things. Um, I, I'll, I'll start on even, like, the Warren Chirac stuff. Um, I think at that moment, my perspective on it um, was kind of like how you said about, well, I was almost explaining to say, well, the rappers are doing it. Don't get mad at the blogger. Um, I don't think at that moment I was at the point where I am now to say you shouldn't treat that subject as you did. You know, um, it, it, while you might think it may have been satirical, it was the wrong thing to be satirical with. Mm -hmm. It was the, it was insensitive to people who did feel um, like, Hey, you're talking about our family members. And, um, one of the things that I, it took me a while also to, to accept is that, you know, because I wasn't there, it might have been a little bit incite, incite a lot of other stuff that happened. Um, that's the accountability that I had to, you know, over time realize to say, hey, listen, if, if you were going to do that or do any coverage on it, um, you either would have not done it at all, or it'd have been completely different with, with reverence. And I and, I, and 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 that's that's one of the things as growth, as we're talking about growth and learning, you get to learn about the the just even the gravity of their platform. Because even to this day, people still bring up the Warren Chirac. Mm -hmm. And and at the moment, I'm thinking this is just some very temporary things that we're going to speed past eventually. It's a strange but, phenomenon, man. Like you see message boards with kids that are treating it like fan fiction and got nicknames and they know this person <coughs> from 0600 block shot this person. These are kids in Belgium, you know? Uh, I was having a, a thought the other day about the role of hip hop. Yeah, in the violence that we experience, man. What do you think and that is? I start to look at the numbers. Everything's pointed and blamed on hip hop, but you know, hip hop listeners are around, give or take 90 million in America any given day, probably more, up to 100. Um, but hip hop and music is only one section of entertainment and culture. You know, you have the film industry or the video game industry. That's an easy 250 million video game players any day. What are the most popular video games? Call of Duty. Mm -hmm. What are the most popular films? The Avengers series is actually number one. James Bond is up there. Pretty much everything that is popular entertainment in America is based on violence. And 
hip hop is so often scapegoated as being the root cause of this violence when really it's a symptom of the disease. And it takes perspective, you know what I mean, for us to step back and be like, am I going to be a part of the disease or am I gonna be a part of the cure? <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the difficult dis decision to make. How does that thought develop? <clears throat> so over time, right, and I guess why I still hear those conversations like, yo, oh, they used to watch one shot records because what drill is now turning to is a global phenomenon. Mm. Like people, like people, they'll, they'll see something happen and then see a real life situation that's, that's associated with it. Hey, he rapped about this and it did happen. Mm. Then they're like, yo, you got to cover Jacksonville. You got, and it's like, People, and it's usually the people who are hitting me up saying this, <clears throat> they'll be from Belgium. Yeah, They're yeah, like, yo, is. they want to be that close to hip hop. And drill music, I believe, was the rawest form and the rawest look they've ever got into something that just, for better or for worse, is just insatiable for the human mind. It seems like the human mind is attracted to paying attention, which attention sells these days to things that are inherently um, destructive or violent. So how do we, I wouldn't necessarily say just drill music in itself, or maybe you think different. I wouldn't, I wouldn't just say the music is bad, because you say it's a symptom. But how do you kind of curb that behavior? Because, you know, I've been, when it came time for New York, New York had their drill movement. I, I, I said I realized what happened in Chicago and my very first comment on New York drill, I said, I don't want any parts of it. And I said, this is murder music. And they kind of, a lot of the artists were like, yo, why are you saying this about our music? And I understood why they said it because that was their escape out of a situation they were in. And I was trying to figure out a way. I'm like, okay, it, it, is it possible for me as a platform to kind of cover this without a sight? And that's where I think we are we are we are with drill music because there's a part of the audience that it's in sensational thirst for this type of stuff. Um, there's always going to be um, real problems that happen in the hoods or the ghettos of the world that gets exacerbated by these records or these songs getting bigger than life. What is the what is the antidote or, 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 or what is the next level to kind of dealing with this? Because Chicago is still dealing with it, right? Chicago's crazy, man. I mean, hip hop, I like to say, is like trauma porn for white America and it triggers their minds in this way that they've always been attracted to the trauma of black people. And as black people create an art representative of our realities, those of us that are gatekeepers, and I say that as someone that's built a structure that has the ability to let things in or let things out, I think it's just important to champion and shine a light on more things than just violence. And the violence in the music is, is a reality of the community, man. That's what we deal with. And by no means am I saying to not support that music. I guess what I'm saying is to hold to the same standard or with the same degree of fanfare other ideas. And beyond that, you gotta address what's going on in the hood, you know? So when you've turned that platform into resources, then now what are you doing to improve the black community? What are you doing to touch the lives of the kids? Cause it's gonna be the next generation. I mean, our generation is, where it is, what's happened has happened. Um, but you can educate the next generation. You can create structures in the community. You can create jobs, even if it's a one person that you can impact. Um, you know, create an employment. Man, it's like violence and crime run concurrently with unemployment. So if you have similar rates of unemployment, Across communities, you have similar rates of violence from South Side of Chicago to rural Appalachia, where they fucked up off opioids. Like, they have similar rates of violence. So I always say, man, it's like, create opportunities, create 
employment create decent standards of living and housing and education. You know what I mean? Like the music is going to reflect the realities of the people. So the realities of the people are fucked up right now. I always thought, and, and I guess it's going to be a long winded question, but I always thought through the years there was trauma that you've seen that maybe you even haven't even even vocalized, whether it's just speaking or even put in music. Um, that was always the backdrop to 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 anything, even whether it's self medicating or not. And I even go back to like other artists, like you know, I did an interview with Dirk, and I thought that was you know he, he named his album Almost Healed, you know. G Herbo dropped a project like last year, PTSD. I remember even listening to um, Fredo Santana, God rest his soul. He was talking about so much, so much of the trauma that he, you know, when people were criticizing him for some drug use, he was just like, hey, listen, I've been through some shit, man. Right. You know, I've been through some shit. And, you know, as you were describing, as you were kind of like maybe losing yourself along the way um, and kind of, you know, kind of doing things that you, you just ordinarily or even now you're like, what was I doing? Um, did that have anything to like to play a part with it? Like, yo, maybe I'm, you know, it, it might be things in my past that I'm not now getting to other illicit drugs or whatever. That's kind of, you know, kind of almost self-medicating trying to get away from. Of course. I mean, that's the nature of drug abuse, man, is this self-medication. And for me, it was never any different. And honestly, so much of what I experienced growing up just led me towards a very violent personality. This is what I adopted as being my value as a man because that's the currency of the ghetto is violence. As a man, what is your capacity for violence? So the way I always considered my masculinity was, well, can I hurt this nigga? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, can I beat this person physically, you know? And at the same time, I'm able to look past the root causes and, and the pain and the anger and sadness beneath that shit because I know that I have the ability and the willingness, you know what I'm saying, to just punch somebody in the face and get it out. Um, but that's ultimately not a self-serving way of being. You know, it's like the more pain that I cause, my own pain multiplies, you know what I mean? And for me realizing that by transforming that and cultivating peace in my life, I could bring in more blessings because through all that bickering, like beefing left and right, I mean, I'm just blocking my blessings, like very literally, you know, I started beef here. I got a festival. Well, now I got to miss this check because they're worried about mm. violence backstage, you know. And in my mind, I'm not realizing that's what I'm doing. I'm thinking, man, shit, I'm right. This nigga's wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that shit counterproductive. So I just came to a space where I'm like, I'm building things. And so if it is not productive and progressive and helping me build things, then I want nothing to do with it. Um, that's interesting. I, I had no idea that that was even going on because you, you had issues, but you know, I always thought you, you, you may have had an anger problem, but we would never see you like get, get <laughs> we never see you get into any physical altercation. <laughs> Did I hit a nail on the head or something? <laughs> and I'm not only saying that because of that, that one that's, comment to me, I was just like, I, I always, <laughs> There was times I would I, I would just kind of just kind of read your demeanor. I'm like, this motherfucker looks like he's just ready to snap. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. It's funny because actually, man, I would go to some interviews like uh -huh. after after our interview. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember I went to a random interview somewhere on the East Coast, you yeah. know, Connecticut, and like, really, I'm a Gemini, so I've always been the nicest guy. But then on the other side of my nature was just like, mm, you know, a real like pent up anger and I would come into interviews and I'd be so nice and smiling and laughing. They'd be like, wow, we thought she was finna come in here and try to smack the shit out of somebody. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, that was never the case. But yes, an anger problem, hell yeah. I mean, shit, I always grew up like, 
I grew up in a violent place, like as a violent person. And yeah, the shit wasn't on camera, but like, well, it was on camera. It just luckily didn't make it on the internet, you know? And, and you got um, into it with people. For sure, a lot, you know? That's always been known about me. Um, Not in the music industry though. No, in Chicago. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, it's just home, you know. Um, was it a, let me tell you this. The moment, the moment they, they would hit me up and be like, listen, we would have had you on this, but you, five of these niggas on this lineup don't <laughs> you like you. You got beef with five yeah, niggas Yeah, it's be like, shit. all right, man. E either I'm going to have to figure out something else or, <laughs> shit, I might just have to be like, listen, I have no beef with these guys. I mean, shit, that happens to, that's, that happens to drill artists more than, more than not. You right? know what, honestly, though, I think the big shift in consciousness for me has been in the principle of judge not lest ye be judged condemn not lest ye be condemned i didn't understand in the past that a judgment on someone else is just inviting judgment to you a condemnation of someone else's flaws is just inviting a condemnation of my own flaws because of course i have them of course i have my own mistakes and most of the issues i got into with people whether it be you or, you know, the comments about triple X and getting into it with people surrounding that. Most of it was from my perspective, based on ideological righteousness or so mm -hmm. I thought, you know what I mean? My campaign was not like I'm trying to beef with black men. My campaign was, I don't appreciate the way that you're speaking about my dead homies in my city. You know, or my campaign was, I don't appreciate the level of acceptance of violence against women in hip hop. But ultimately, it was an aha moment when I realized I have a line in my new album actually where I'm like, um, so speaking down on a dead man's image when that's the same reason I was beefing with academics. No matter what we got, karma comes back to get us, you know? Cause that didn't resonate to me. I didn't understand that, you know? It's like, I'm, into it with you about what you said about my dead homie. And here I am saying this about mm. his dead homie. He can't have it both ways. Where's, by the way, you also touched on something and there's a saying, I think, I think it goes like, like ego and pride are usually the last thing before the downfall. And you usually find some of like, sometimes, you know, I feel like I, I, I ego gets the best of me a lot of times too, but, Ego sometimes has us do or go off on these routes. Like, for example, you you, you said it right. Like, you're, you're you. It wasn't necessarily personal, especially like say say the like the whole thing with X, right? You're like, well, just ideologically, I stand for these things. So if someone else who I feel is in opposition to it, I'm casting judgment on them, mm -hmm. and I'm riding on this, which now. Obviously, they're not going to be like, "Hey, you're just right." So now, <laughs> now it's like an opposition shit, and then now it they forget about what happened. Yeah, you know what I mean. And that's what I realize is like sometimes what you say is not even as important as how you say it. And many times, my message was lost in my delivery, mm. and that's counterproductive. If my purpose here is to bring truth to the people, then I have to do it in such a way that doesn't completely cloud and overshadow the point. Once the point's lost, now it's just a battle of egos and pride. Cause beyond that, I might've said this about him, but now since that person loves him, now I'm going back and forth with them. And this just ain't about shit at all. Don't nobody even remember what this was about. You know, they just see the cloud of beef, you know? Like, yo, this shit was crazy. One time I was outside the county jail and- um, which, which county jail? In Chicago. Cook County, okay. Um, I was trying to go visit my homie. And this woman who worked at the hospital nearby, she came, uh, she came by, she was showing me love, man. At that time, I was like doing everything I was doing. So she gave me a new port and she had some Douce in a water bottle. She was, she was an <laughs> angel on earth because uh, they didn't let me in jail because I was on probation, you know. And so then she asked me, uh, you know, my name. I told her who I was. And this was near the X thing. And she was like, oh yeah, Vic Mesa, didn't I just see you like in the news with like some uh, like domestic abuse or something? And I was like, damn, that's crazy because 
just the fact that I attached myself to that concept. Now you don't even know the story. You don't know that I was calling out domestic abuse. Okay, okay. You just know that it's you saw me. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? You see the correlation of it. Um, you, you've been really close, you know, even with like, you know, Rock Nation, Jay-Z and everything. Um, does any OG like hitch up? Because I, I, what you're describing is what I think a lot of artists do sometimes. They're... They're they're not speaking out of a place of hate, but they feel like they're speaking for people they also represent. Not knowing that a lot of times when you give an opinion, like you know they always say the the, the, the tongue could be more powerful than the sword. So these issues and these people are not like you. Said, did any OG tell you like yo hey listen man yo just chill out like don't even like you you, you might see it you might whatever, but you you could spread your message without being against a person. You know, the ones that really loved me did, you know what I'm saying, at different times. Like, Hove definitely told me, like, cut it. You know what I mean? Cut the bickering and the beefing. My big sister, Aja Monet, she definitely came to me in that same time. And I wasn't trying to hear her because I wanted to hear people that told me, you right. Mm. You know what I mean? You standing for what's right. You know what I mean? Um at that at that moment, those are the people I wanted to hear, you know. But I ultimately came to really appreciate Aja Monet and others because um, they didn't even make the conversation about was my purpose right. It's it's not always about your purpose; it's about your impact. You know what I mean? Your intention is not the same as the way that you really make people feel as your action. You know, your action and your impact is what's going to resonate. Your intention is known to you, and so I appreciated the people that came to me and did have the hard conversation with me. Like, man, you need to cool out with this, you know? What was the, um, I guess I would say, maybe that one moment you're like, I'm doing this all wrong. And I know you, you mentioned a few things in shows, but I, I got to imagine there got to be something just, because it, it, it feels like your way of thinking about those situations is just different now. And you're just like, if I could probably handle it, um, handle those things um, again, you would probably do it in a much different way. So, so I'm, I'm wondering what that what that like eureka moment is, or that moment you're, you're like, okay, this either isn't gonna get me anywhere, or yo, I'm going about this all wrong. You know, ultimately, it's like at the point when I find myself now, I'm beefing with countless people, people I never even heard of. You yeah. Know, I'm beefing with now. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And and it's all stemmed from from this one moment. Um that shit was even deeper than people really know. You know what I'm saying? It was like that shit spilled beyond music for show. That shit spilled into street shit. And it's Were you moving different? It's like, shit going on for show because it's money on my head, you know? It's 10 racks here, okay, now it's 20 racks, now it's 50 racks, you know. So, you know where I come from, so I'm tapping in with them. Now it's behind the scenes, gang, street politics, shit going on. I'm like, yo, this shit is so far beyond what I came here to do. You know what I mean? Like, I'm a light. I'm a, a positive force on the planet and found myself in the midst of all this Negativity. I really resonate with Tupac's trajectory and his documentary because it's so easy to get veered off your course by resentment. And that's why I keep coming back to the fact that gratitude has given me an entire new perspective. Mm. And that's the primary theme in a lot of the music that I'm making, even that freestyle is, you know, an assessing and analyzing things. Uh, from an abundant perspective and not from a, you know, purely confrontational and, and a place of anger, you know what I mean? Eureka moment though, um, I did have a Eureka moment recently when I got into it with somebody in a whole different situation, you know? Um, and it was like a guy I grew up with and he backed over me for some for some money. I'm hustling. This was before I got into the legal cannabis business. I was like stepping back into the black market shit and 
this goes left, you know, I end up whooping him. He's mad. He wants to get some people to kill me, all this. And, uh, you know, it kind of like, fuck my spirit up, you know? Now I'm moving around with this gun and all this and the extra shit. And I handled that wrong. Give it a year. I was faced with another situation that resurfaced, a similar situation from the past. And I approached it with a different perspective. And instead of going back and forth with this nigga and doing all that, um, I was just leaning on, leaning on prayer, giving it no energy, not responding, placing God between me and all those that wish to do me harm. And, you know, he's telling me, oh, I'm going to find you here. I'm going to catch you there. And I told him, man, you know, God bless you, man, you know? And it just, it just kind of fell away of its own weight. And I was like, fuck, you could do that? Like, I can move with so much grace and I can move with so much faith and power in myself that that hating shit will just shed of its own weight and fall by the wayside. This is way easier than being to put hands on everybody that says something I disagree with. How do you control your ego in those cases? Because now I know you know you you having that that little conscious battle of like you got the 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 two so. the two of them on your shoulder and they're like yo you let that nigga talk to you like that like yo come <laughs> on come yo you done you done worse for people saying less stop playing so like how do you how do you kind of control that or, or is it like maybe the experiences you've been through that that just says. Man, I'm not about to keep doing the same shit and, and, and getting the same results. I've done the other things so many times, you know. I had I had to try something new because I used to feel like I was at the absolute mercy of anybody that says something like that to me, you know. If a nigga called me a bitch, then I got to be ready to die about it, mm. you know. That's a lot of black men. For sure. Well, and that, by the way, it, it, funny enough, I remember... I think I think the internet was trying to get to me after a while. They were trying to get you, and and they were like, "Yo, they were like, yo, you let that man sit there and call you a bitch. Like you gotta go yo, get up it, with him. Yo, it made me think t so many times. <laughs> I'm like, yo, what is the right thing to do? And I always said, well, you know, listen, we still having a conversation. He didn't put no hands on me. I'm thinking about that, which is which I think is, is more of a ego less approach. But everybody's like, nah, that's not how we deal you with it. To figure it and out. so once they call you a bitch, you're supposed to went upside his head. You should say, let's go right now. So so I remember thinking about that. I'm like, so I should have just crashed out. That's the only thing they respect. I'm like, I'm being honest. Like the conversation was that if I guarantee if I had crashed out, right? Complex would be like, yo, you're, you're no good for us. All right, we got to get you on out of here, right? Who knows what happens behind that, right? Everybody would be like, ah, yeah, he did like a real nigga. So, so I, I've also realized that your ego sometimes in dealing with certain things. And like, I think, I think just, I don't know if it's maybe across all races, but, but, but I know a lot of black men, you call them out their name, like they, they, they'll die so over weird. it. You know? you know, I thought about it though. Actually, the real Eureka moment for me was something that I opened my album with, actually. And I was driving drunk. I had a party after the Kanye album and took a molly that day. I was teed up. Ended up disrespecting my girl, accidentally being so fucked up. And I'm chasing her, trying to go apologize. Drunk driving, total this Range Rover. Mm. Um, and can't get the car to move. I got a dirty pistol in the back seat. Oh my God. I got two gun cases already. Jeez. Dirty gun in the back seat. And yo, I caught the ultimate blessing. You know, it's like my friend came, got the car out of there, got the gun out of there. Just a week before that, I had been in the mosque for the first time and I was praying to God just like in earnest for the first time and saying, if you could get me through these things I'm going through, psh, I'm going to turn my life around. I'm going to change things. And I didn't even really know what I was praying for yet. Because until I totaled that car with the gun in the back seat, I wasn't as low as I could have been. Because had I got popped for that, things would have been a lot different. I would have had to sit. And so at that moment, man, I stopped drinking. I stopped smoking. You know what I mean? I've been sober since. That was like about two years ago. Mm. And 
that entire experience was my eureka moment for real to start approaching this shit differently and you know approaching conflict differently approaching my ego as you said differently with more clarity and with intention because before that I was, I was just I was just moving I was just doing things moving with the wind but now it's like when I step I feel like I'm stepping with intention and we all got to challenge our ego one of my big homies I speak to him he's in a prison in Illinois Dixon prison man he's like his name is Suavel. He's actually on my project. He's like spitting this story about Egyptian history. To like the Hitler Yes. Nick's brilliant. Um, you know, but he tells me, man, he's like, every morning I wake up, I open my eyes and I begin to challenge my ego. It's a constant process. You know, it's something that you got to stay vigilant. Something he also told me that gave me perspective in that other situation I was speaking on. He was like, never let a nigga trick you into killing them. Mm. <laughs> As somebody that's sitting in there doing 25 years in prison. Wow. And uh, Suave gonna be home. You know, I'm working on it right now. Actually, when I was on Sway the other day, I had my guy Musa on there who I helped to bring home from a 25 year sentence 12 years early. So he was Suavell's Selly. So now Musa's home and we working on Suavel's freedom. I got him linked up with some great people doing clemency. And uh yeah, he's gonna be home. So shout out to my boy Suavel. Somehow we're gonna have to get this podcast into the joint. Hey, that that's a very powerful line. Don't let, never let a nigga trick you into killing them. Um wow. You've been you've been doing and kind of active in prison reform a bit. Um, you know, trying to help people out in situations that either the, the rights were taken advantage of or some of these guys who, you know, never got a second chance. Um, what drew you to that? My brother James Warren, he got locked up a few years back in the middle of a mental health crisis. He had just lost his brother and his cousin in a span of two, three months. So he was zanned out crashed out, you know, shot, really got over sentenced to 15 years for a leg shot. And just through like building this relationship with him where honestly I came into it thinking, I'm gonna do this to help James, you know, I'm gonna be here as a resource for him. And that relationship began to help me so much and just yeah. like, give me a constant sense of what I have. You know what I mean? You talk to people in the prison every day, you start to realize whatever I'm dealing with out here, it's nothing. It's nothing. In freedom, like I got to get up this morning and choose to get on a flight. Yeah. You know what I mean? I got to get up this morning and decide that I'm gonna come talk to you. Mm -hmm. um, this is an opportunity that, you know, the guys don't have. And so through James being locked up and then meeting Musa and Man, the moment when I sent Musa's stuff to the governor of Illinois and he still had 13 years left on his sentence. You know, he's telling me I can't write, I can't read, I can't think. All I could think about is coming home. And I'm like, dude, you're not coming home no time soon. And, you know, sent his stuff to the governor and he came home three days later. Wow. That was when I was just, I was changed by that. I was like, oh, no, like, this is... I feel like that was a calling almost for you. For sure. You know what I mean? I was like, this is a moment that I have to honor and respect. And it taught me, you know, to have faith in the unseen, to be able to believe in what I cannot see. And throw. so through that, I just started leaning into it. So, hey, if I could connect you with somebody here, if I could help this person there, like, I believe that putting that energy into the universe is not only the right thing to do, but it comes back to you tenfold. You never know how it's gonna come back to you. Mm. I, I hear a lot of, of how spirituality is kind of guiding you, um, whether it's through faith or just, you know, you kind of understanding like a lot of the energy that, you know, you could surround yourself with. I'm wondering, were you always like that, just in different forms, or you know, no. recently, <laughs> you know, like because sometimes, like sometimes, I, I know people they'll just 
they'll understand how the world works and how, you know, spiritually they need to be right. But sometimes the wrong things pay off. Yeah, you get what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like, I know people going through conflict with that where they're like, well, shit, I'm not a bad person, but the bad shit I do or the 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 bad, you know, aura I give out kind of pays me back luxuriously. Right. And that's a conflict in itself. So, so I'm mm -hmm. wondering, um, you know, as you gave the story about you going to the mosque for the first time, um, how were you before compared to now? I was agnostic, honestly. Really? I definitely was anti-Christianity because the narrative of a white Jesus really upset me growing up. And I didn't really believe in God much. You know, I, I would say I was spiritual in a sense, but I didn't see the value in religion and in faith in that way. And when I started to study it, man, and really start to use those principles, then I just saw things in my life began to shift, you know? Whereas when I was going through things before and I felt like, you know, I'm battling everyone and the world, I felt utterly alone in that. I didn't know the value of bringing God into what I'm doing, into my words, into my actions, into my intentions. And having that perspective shift, man, it's been cataclysmic for me because I don't feel like I approach this shit alone. I feel like I'm approaching this in acknowledgement of a higher power always with me. I come from voodoo lineage, so my ancestors are ever present. I bring them into what I'm doing. Um, and I wasn't like that before at all, you know? I was just like vindictive, you know what I'm saying? Mm. Wow. Um, I, I seen in the last year or so, y'all damn near brought everybody but me to Ghana. Ex 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 <laughs> ex 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 explain why Ghana? And, and, and explain, because you know, Hey, At I, first, I thought it was funny, G, when you had a video and you nah. was like, who they going to be performing for? The goats and the chickens? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, no. I did have a joke about it. I was like, I was like, man. I, I thought that was mad. I was like, man, I, I fucked up Vic Mensa, man. I'm like, I got this nigga performing in Ghana. <laughs> but but um, I'm going to be honest with you. I watched how. Yeah, that um, was a movie. Yeah, that was. Whose idea was to, to even go to Ghana? And why Ghana? Like, I'm, I'm, uh, it, it was beautiful watching just so many black entertainers go back to some place that they, it felt like they had more of a connection with than, you know, it, it was just lineage oriented. Um, and also I seen people that was just having a great old time over there. Like I see, I seen even Meek out there. Meek was just like loving it. You know what I mean? Like I seen so many people just kind of, uh, like when Niggas it comes out to the, there starting riots, that shit was hilarious. See, when it comes to the African continent, like me, I'm like in more in tune with like Nigeria because of the Afro beast and having mm -hmm. friends from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ghana is, is kind of a place that I don't know too much about. It's kind of newer to the zeitgeist right now. Uh, but I'm Ghanaian, so really, half of my family lives in Ghana. So I've been going to Ghana since I was 11 years old. At that time, I can't say that I would have ever imagined that this cross pollination of cultures would exist in the way it does. But two, three years ago, when I was first starting to inject myself into the culture in Ghana without my family, build my own relationships, I just started to realize that it doesn't make any sense that we as black artists perform everywhere else on the planet, except for the continent of our origin. Like I've performed in England, a million times, performed in France and Spain and Germany, Germany a lot, Finland, you know what I mean, Norway, all across Asia, without ever stepping foot to hold a mic in my own country, on my own continent. So I just started to imagine creating a vessel to connect these worlds. And I knew people was going to get on board because we as black people, we long for Africa, even beyond all of the narratives of poverty and scarcity that are fed to us to make us fear or devalue Africa. 
it's in our DNA to long for Africa. I think that mold is breaking. Like, like I, I've told people, I'm like, there's no European country I, I, I care to travel to, but I definitely want to go to Lagos. I want to go to Lagos, Nigeria. Word. It looks like it looks like the closest thing I could imagine to Wakanda. Um, I see so so many like so 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 many of my friends are from Nigeria, but like every time I see them get married or I see like th- th- how they live there, I'm like, this just seems so dope. You get what I mean? But there is a thought um, still among, you know, I think a lot of people in the U.S., black Americans in the U.S., that when we think about Africa, we just think about, imagine like the the, the most poverty stricken area in, in, in the U.S., but like 10 times worse. So and that's the thought a lot of people have. Right. I, I think a lot of people are they're breaking that mold now because we're seeing musicians kind of come over here and they're, they're all looking like royalty. Like it's not looking how we perceived it to be looking. Right. Um that's why I was also shocked about Ghana because I had no idea what to expect. Yeah, we didn't create those narratives, you know? The narrative of Africa being nothing but poverty is a European narrative that's used to devalue and justify the exploitation of Africa. So in creating this festival, the Black Star Line Festival, I knew that we were gonna be writing our own narrative. And I knew that that's a necessary action to take, combating so much psychological warfare that we've endured. And so many images of starving Ethiopian children to make you think that's all that exists in Africa. And so I was like, man, let me just get my people on board. You know, one of the first people that came to my mind was Chance. I was like, he's got that revolutionary mindset that I have. And together, I think we could really build something crazy and people can come and they can see that what you've been taught and what you've been shown is only a fraction of the story. Obviously, Africa is the most resource rich continent on the planet. That's why we have iPhones is because Coltan is mined out of the Congo and it's kids getting their hands chopped off for it. For sure. I mean, the exploitation of Africa is the reason why we got gold chains, why we have diamonds. I mean, like, all of this is built off the back of Africa's wealth. And somehow they've been able to trick us into thinking that Africa is a one-dimensionally impoverished place. But in reality, man, it's like, there's people living well in Africa. There's people living at standards of wealth that it's hard to even, like, imagine in America and standards of poverty. That's hard to imagine. Um, but they're all our people. So we got to connect and we got to bring them home. That's why we made the festival. I always looked at you and there was something that, that always came across with your aura, your messaging that, that you were almost on some like, Black militant, like black, almost like Black Panther type of vibe. That's the, I've always gotten that. Um, super pro black, but like in a in a more militant sense than just just saying it. You know what I mean? Um, would it be something? You're, you're not you're not like in the idea that you know we go back to Africa or something like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> that we go. Back. I am in the idea that we go back to Africa for sure. That we get up and go. I'm not saying that we abandon America, but I am saying that we go build things in Africa, and that it will be our unification that can lead to our liberation as isolated peoples. Because at the end of the day, we are African people. I'm an African person of Ghana. You're West Indian, yeah. right? You, from where? I'm from Jamaica, which from Jamaica. it all routes from Africa. You know what I mean? Jamaicans are. The ship just went one little place. Ghanaian, yeah, yeah. actually. Like, they have Ghanaian words in some of their patois and the Maroon villages. Uh, I got to do a 23 of me, man, honestly. To really pe- you go find out some Ghana, but you giving me Nigerian, though. I ain't going to lie to you. Two level <laughs> Nigerian, man. Give me some jollof rice. You know what I mean? You giving me Nigerian. But we're African people, man, across the globe. And it's like we're all constantly struggling and striving for our liberation, but we're very isolated. And it is the black militant tradition and the Black Panther Party and Angela Davis and Huey P. Newton that, always preached that our unity was going to be the key to our freedom. As isolated in our different silos, 
we're going to continue to be exploited. But at the point in time when the black American populace and the black American dollar starts to collaborate with the continent of Africa in a major way, don't let the continent of Africa get a unified currency and drive out the French and drive out the British and drive out the Americans and drive out the Chinese influence. Um, the bargaining and the leverage is going to be very different. Like, our median wealth in America as black people is zero dollars in a household compared to a hundred dollars for a white household. Um, I can't even imagine what that would be in comparison with many African countries. Um, and like, but our spending power is so massive and the fan bases and the, the people that appreciate our art and our culture and our entertainment in Africa is so massive. I mean, they use their phones for everything, as we do. Mobile money is so much more prevalent in Africa than it is in America. I can't even buy from grocery stores in Chicago with a tap to pay. There's nothing I can't buy with my phone in Ghana. I could buy mangoes from a woman on the side of the road. Really? So anybody who's thinking critically would be like, okay, so there's a huge spending power here. There's a huge group of people there moving money through the phone. I could probably get some money tapping these demographics together. So that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that we build things in Africa using our resources here and human beings and resources and culture there and collaborate. How do you balance all this? So in, in one realm, you know, and we had this conversation before even the camera got on, like a lot of, a lot of musicians these days, you know, um, we're kind of seeing almost people who are, even putting the message in the music, kind of almost just getting a little bit, a little bit thin. Like it's not that many people, um, but you stand for something. You represent uh, um, an idea. You represent a message. You represent a movement. But also, you're a musician that some people might just look at and say, "I, I just wanted to make some cool ass songs, man." Like, how do you get to balance both, and does it become compromising? Um, when your art sometimes has to merge the two rather than just go either war. I think I just try to be genuine to myself, man. You know, so obviously I make music about the radical concepts and shit, but I also make music about just having fun, you know, and both are realities of myself. It do get a little conflicting though. I ain't gonna lie, you know, Cause I'm like this 24 seven, but I'm like that too, you know? Yeah. And um, ultimately, man, honesty, you know, I just try to be honest and be real, you know? So if I'm feeling turned up today, then that might be the music I make today. If I'm feeling introspective tomorrow, then that might be the song that I do tomorrow. I love albums though. I feel like. How do you balance it on an album? That's what I'm saying. I think an album gives you the right format in which you can address the different sides of your humanity. And sometimes I think that might be lost in a, in a time when it's all about like constant single dropping. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I, I do think that the art of the album is maybe a bit less upheld than it was. You know what I mean? It comes with a lot of, pr a lot of pressure too. I, shit, I remember... You know, Lil Baby, who's a rapper who makes a lot of turned up anthems, he does bigger picture, and then he he kind of comes out and let people know, like, hey, listen, don't don't keep expecting these type of records, because also he doesn't want to get put in a box. You get what I mean? Like, you know, I feel like a lot of times um, fans and even critics put you in a box where it's like, well, you're the, you're the this type of rapper now, so we want to hear this from you, and um, you know, that also kind of gets trumped up and I, we were talking about this as well off camera about just like at, back, back in the day it's like your label might come to you and be like yo we need this mainstream record right here we need some shit for the chicks to shake they shake their ass shake them bbls like what you got going on over here is like yeah this is cool and everything i know you got like an audience for it but we need to get this shit shaking right now what's going on so um I think now we're, we're not in that time as much because we're seeing artists kind of, you know, create their own um, their own vertical, like which might be considered niche, but it turns out to be eventually mainstream. Um, how do you kind of like like look at all that, even outside of making an album? 
I think you'd be surprised by how versatile the audiences can be. You know, like my new record, Swish, with Chance and G-Eazy, I was actually kind of like, man, you know, is my audience going to resonate because this is about shaking ass and shit and, like, are they really going to be able to feel it? And honestly, it's like the same audience that loves me to be so conscious, like, they also love me to have fun. You know what I mean? Like, the people listening to the music are not so different from the people making the music. You know what I mean? It's like we're all human beings. We want to experience some real shit. We want to experience something that'll make us think and grow. And we also want to experience something that just makes us jump or something that just makes us have a good time. Um, and yeah, it is about zoning in on your audience. Like I got a new app, man. It's like called, it's called community. And so I sit here and I just text my fans. You know what I mean? I just set time apart. Um, you can text me at 312 Eight four seven two two zero three. That's, That's like my community, community number. You know what I mean? Um, How does that work? It's ill. It's like that's just going to your phone. Yeah, it's going to my phone, and so and it looks like basically just kind of looks like an iPhone messages app. You know, and those and, are the messages. Yeah, and Holy so shit. like here's, uh, like I sent a book to the people in my in my group one time, and um. It's called The Game of Life and How to Play It. This this book has been like super impactful to me. It's a little book just about like How many pages? Spiritual law. Like I, it can't be more than like a hundred pages. It's probably less. Who's the author? Florence Scovel Shin. How'd you find that? Yo, it's this artist named David Sebastian. He's a rapper from LA, also a painter. He's amazing. Yeah, I know. You know David yeah, Sebastian? Yeah. Super cool. So he put me on this book. Shit changed my life. Um, so I sent it to my community app, you know, and uh, then this this person, Jess Farrell, she texted me like, am I about to become a whole new person? She got a copy of the book, you know, and so I'm just like, hell yeah, you know, I'm just tapping in. It's like yeah. we in a different time, man, when it's like the streaming platforms and so many of the structures are very one-sided and you're making what is it point zero zero four dollars per stream um so if you get a million streams what is, what's a million streams pz is it four racks or yeah, it's like four thousand uh, four thousand dollars the the model has to be isolating your your fan group and engaging with them directly you know what i mean of course we're going to continue streaming but I feel like my new MO is like, how do I directly connect with the listener, with the audience? How do I build a relationship with them? How do I build a conversation with them? Music, especially rap music, is a conversation. And so conversation is the building blocks of a relationship. If I can build the relationship directly with my audience, and then when I have something to market, I have a product or merch or an album i go directly to the people that i've built a relationship with first i mean i can make exponentially more sense on the dollar than i'm getting from spotify i've always and even though we, we are streaming here on spotify but I, I've, <laughs> shout, shout out, out spotify. to spotify I, I've, I've thought i've thought this though right so so they show your monthly listeners on, on spotify it would behoove and help artists more if there's if they said hey listen you have Five million monthly listeners. You could send out an email once a month to those people, updating them even if you didn't drop music, or also engaging them on other type of level. I feel like you know the streaming platforms they still do what they do to control that relationship, right? So, so you know theoretically, as as you know, um, technology has advanced. Ultimately, you want a one-to-one -one relationship where, like, they should be in your phone, right? They, sh you should, you should be able to say, "Hey, listen, I got you guys' emails. Yo, ch yo, check your email. I'm dropping the song just for you guys. You guys are my most loyal fans." And like, there's ways to do it, but like, I think streaming the streaming services have like all the data, and they could easily just be like, "Hey, listen, we're not giving these motherfuckers names and nothing like that. Maybe they could opt in if they want to share it with you somehow, or whatever." 
But you get their email address. You get to directly communicate with 5 million of your fans because they're listening to your music anyway. They can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> they can't do that. I mean, you know, it's like, it's a balance, man. It's a give and take because streaming has enabled us to have all the music that we want to listen to in one place. Mm. You know, and the reality is like, if it's not on Spotify, bro, I can't even say that I'm really going to listen to it, you know, because I might have to try too hard. Like, I'm going to go back and listen to <laughs> Lil Wayne mixtapes yeah, yeah, yeah. on YouTube because, like, I think, like, I uh, really live mixtapes are spin really just, like, shut down or something like that. Like, one of Man. them went out of it. And that that's part that's, of... That's, like, a niche moment for me, too, even though, you know what I mean? It's like, if I want to listen to music, I'm going to Spotify, you know? And so that is a way in which um, it's centralized and like made it easier to find a lot of dope shit. But at the same time, you know, it behooves an artist for show to build your own relationship with your fan base because there's certain things that a streaming platform, a DSP, in their own benefit, they can't share all the information that's with true. you. That's you know true. what I mean? And you don't need to go through them. But, but, but also sometimes as an artist, you're at the mercy of the curation, right? So if you make a song that f fits algorithmically or, you know, when the curators are picking it out to say, hey, this is a top 10 on rap caviar, great. Like, you know, like your music is now being no, heard by more. And it gets you right? to people that didn't know about you. Like I got the utmost appreciation for Spotify because they show me a lot of love on the playlist. And it's my boy Carl right there, Carl Cherry. Shout out to Carl Cherry, a great dude. Um, and, and they whole team, like they show me a lot of love and that gets my music to like, yo, I was on this gaming playlist recently on Spotify, really? you know what I'm saying? I am not personally a gamer, but it was like, that's a huge demographic of people that have, you know, just had my music placed in front of them. And that's something that you don't really have without, um, without a Spotify, you know what I mean? I think it's just like up to artists in a modern time to how do I treat myself like my own Spotify as well? You know what I mean? How do I make use of the existing structures, but also seek to like build my own structure and build my own relationship with the people that keep my shit afloat with the people that care about what I have to say and care the most, you know what I mean? Cause your average, like, yeah, yeah, I yeah. just heard you on a playlist yeah, or, okay. you know what I mean? They not going to text the number and sit there and like, is this really you? You know what I mean? Go yeah. back and forth with me about that. But somebody that's been listening to me since their sophomore year of high school, you know what I mean? That like saw me in Denver and in Lollapalooza and Coachella, something like that person might just, you know, be here. And as you can see, like I'd be really texting them. You know what I mean? Yeah, like I can see. I'm communicating with them. You know what I'm saying? Because like I'm grateful for them. I appreciate them. And I recognize like the value of building that relationship with my people. Like, like, like you said, a niche, like build my own relationships with my own listeners, focus on that. You know what I mean? Everybody's always thinking about the broadest net when maybe it would behoove us to like pinpoint our focus a little bit more to who really cares. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Who cares enough to take an extra step? In the music creation process, because when listening to you over the years, I've always said, I feel like in, in a direction um, state, like because I think you have interest in your talents are kind of multifaceted. If like there might be some people who like you that want to, want you to drop an album where you're just just like how you just killed L.A. Leakers for yourself. You know what I mean? They're like, yo, we just want that. We just want to straight rap and just whatever, whatever. But we've seen you kind of also venture into kind of other genres. You you you've genre bended a lot, and kind of um, just kind of showcase your talents just outside of what people might consider traditional hip hop. Um, when you're creating a project, how intentional is it when you're you're introducing the people to new sounds or even like yo know, new genres because you have to have a feel or a semblance of a feel of what your fans mm -hmm. want versus what you're going to give them as an artist. I think first and foremost, you got to move with spirit, you know, and let your creativity take the reins. What do I have to say? What 
are my most empirical truths? What is my purpose? What is my message? And from there, now how do I get it across? You know, do I Trojan horse this idea into a more kind of appealing commercial sound? Do I set this joint apart to be like, you know, the bar down part of a record? But, you know, the reality is like the records that have made me the most money have not been the most densely lyrical shit. You know what I mean? It's like more melody and uh, like bounce and energy. You know what I mean? All the records that stream the most. So I feel like it's just something that you find a balance, you know, find a happy medium between um, what I want to say and what the fuck people want to hear, man. Like that that's a difficult thing as an artist, you know what I mean? But something that you have to come to terms with is like, man, I'm not just making this music for myself, you know? And I think that's like part of the perspective shift for me is also approaching music in that way and like thinking about uh, how do I best get my message across? I mean, it's to be heard, you know what I mean? So first of all, um, I have to take note of the records that stream the most for me and the things that people resonate towards. Um, and also like notice those things early on. What do people, what collaborations do people love? You know what I'm saying? Um, I really like try to focus on collaborating with people that I love, you know, to begin with. Um, and so, you know, I just had a joint with Chance. Um, g Easy is another close friend of mine, somebody that um, I've just known since, like, I don't know, got to be, like, 2010, 2011, when I was in a band, actually. Really? Me and g Easy, we might even, I don't know if we toured together, did some shows together, like, when I was in high school. Uh, next record I'm dropping from the album is a joint that's me and Ty. And, um, you know, I, I first connected with Ty. Ty Dollar? Yeah, with Ty Dollar. Super talented. So talented. And just one of those voices that you hear Ty's voice and you just like, yo, it sounds amazing every time, every song. Um, I first connected with Ty, I believe, when we were doing SNL 40 with Ye for Wolves. I think that was like the first time I really connected with Ty. And uh, we got a record coming out. It was ill because when I was in LA recently, I was doing a shoot for Spin Magazine and I went to this Muslim school in Crenshaw District. And I met this young dude and I was like, Ty was on my mind already because I was in LA, we finishing this record. I wanted to pull up on him and like play him the final mix. And I met this young guy at the Muslim school and he was like, yo, you a rapper, man? He probably like 12, 13. Solid kid, though. You know, you could just tell he's solid. He's like, man, my dad's a rapper. And I'm like, oh, word. He's like, yeah, his name's Big TC. You ever heard of him? And it blew my mind because I was like, yo, that's Ty's big brother, you know? Um, oh, you knew that already? Yeah, because Ty has an album called Free TC, Ty's first album. His, his like, debut full-length studio album is called Free oh, TC. Oh, shit. And so the whole thing is, like, basically an ode to his brother. So his brother's got a, a song on there. His brother's a crazy artist, like melodies and bars, and he's locked up. And I've talked to Ty many times about just how he's campaigning for his freedom and working on it. And so when I met his son in that moment, who's Ty's nephew, um, I was like, oh man, that's just one of those like synchronicity moments, you know what I'm saying? Of things really coming together to show you you in the right place at the right time. Cause I love his pops music and obviously, you know, he's Ty's nephew. I thought that was so ill. Yeah, th th that seems like something that might be just fate at that point when you see things come together like Straight that. Straight up, I talked I talked to Big TC over the phone. So yeah, free TC, man, super talented. Go listen to that. What's the name of the miracle? Ooh, it's a miracle. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, he nice. must, he must be you gotta listen. Yeah, he must be killing him. His shits. brother be snapping, like nah, for real. Like his his brother be snapping. Hey, what's the relationship like um, with you and Chance? 
now and how it's evolved over the years? I, I, I feel like you guys have always been like, you know, um, locked into certain extents, but, but it's, it feels like now there's a, I don't know, it, it feels like you guys are really locked in. Like, how has that relationship, you know, uh, been in, you know, clearly you have a song with him. It feels like it's it's at the place where it should have always been, right? Word, yeah. I mean, you know, me and Sean grew up together. So our first studio session was, like, together. His pops got us a studio, and we did this song called Lord Release. Ooh, that sample was hot. I had some bars on there, too. Um, and so... It, it's like, it's a brotherly relationship, you know? It's like, that was age 14, probably. So the shit that we've been through together is like too much to quantify uh, beyond music. And I think just like in time, like probably in our early 20s, just coming into money and fame and ego, like we clashed for a period of time, you know what I'm saying? It just didn't get along, didn't see eye to eye, as brothers do, you know what I mean? Um, ultimately, like, when he came and joined me in Ghana, um, 2021, I think, or 2022, I don't know. Um, I think that just, like, matured our relationship to a, a dynamic where it is now and strengthened it, honestly, because it's something about the motherland just brings people together, you know what I'm saying? And kind of washes away some of that old shit to recognize like the opportunity that we have in our brotherhood and collaboration. And so, you know, we went on to do the festival like very quickly um, and just been working on mad music. Like we got so many records, you know, so it's a collab tape that we've been kicking around for a while. Ooh. Just like so many songs and verses and, we be doing like writing exercises and I be pushing, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like I always try to come in and like maybe come with a, a write-in prompt to be like, yo, let's do seven minute drills on this. Something I actually, that's something I learned from a J. Cole interview. Um, really? Or like different writing exercises I might've got from my sister Aja Monet. I got some of my own from when I was a kid and would just literally sit there and like take, 10 minutes, do, write the hardest verse you can in 10 minutes. You know, do another verse on one rhyme scheme in 10 minutes. And so through that, like, a lot of records have come from it. And so that's something that we holding on to right now, just kind of like figuring out what to do with all those records. Sounds like almost, you know, steel sharp and steel as well. Gotta be, yeah. It, but, but it seems like even more than music, just, you know, from a brotherhood perspective, like, you know, spirit, spirituality-wise as well, right? 100% man, you know, like, obviously Chance is very Christian and I ain't get that shit in the past, you know what I mean? Like, I just didn't, bro. Um, I remember I pissed them all off on Christmas one year, man. In what you, you said something? Oh, nah. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you disrespect to Jesus now. <laughs> no, I ain't no, gonna Jesus. say nothing about it. I'm no, just Jesus. Say, I'm just gonna say I pissed them off on Christmas in a group chat, man. You know, but like as time has as time has passed, and I've come to like really like appreciate um, the Christian faith and like study the Bible on my own. You know what I mean? And like see the truth in it then it's like that's another dynam uh, dynamic or dimension to our relationship as well. It's like just like, you know, passages of the Bible and stories of faith and those things that I didn't appreciate in the past. Like I didn't, I wasn't open to them. You know He's what I'm saying? He's probably proud of you because you, like, I mean, if you're coming from a place of being kind of agnostic and to like where you are now, I'm, I'm, I'm you're exuding a lot of, you know, faith and belief, which, you know, would be the opposite of, how you probably were living or even thinking about. Yeah, you know how they own Amber Rose right now for uh like what she been saying on that reality show? Oh yeah, the the little the, the school thingy. That's fake how I was coming. Oh word? Like just trying to be isn't she kinda in there like antagonizing a little bit, yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And telling her perspective. Yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? But I was holding a kind of similar perspective, man. You know, um but the Bible is so ill. Like I never really I never really realized that that book that I was speaking about earlier, 
the game of life and how to play it. It gave me an amazing tool to bring the Bible into a context that works really well for me. And that's any time that you see the word Lord translated to law, because the book is all about spiritual law. So when it says vengeance is mine, said the Lord, I personally don't resonate as much with like this vengeful, angry God, but I do completely rec recognize that the law is as it is. So vengeance's mind says the law, like if you steal, you will be stolen from. If you kill, you will experience that. It's like, now that makes sense to me. You know mm. what I mean? Um, and yeah, man, since I've been more so studying about now when they throw their Bible verses in the group chat, you know, <laughs> what do you do now? Man, I feel that, you know what I mean? Uh, like, it hit different. <laughs> no, it hits different. I, I tap in, you know? I, I wasn't tapping in back then. I wasn't on that. Nah, that's kind of dope. Uh, you were on the, was it the 14 double XL cover? Or the 15, 14, right? Or maybe 13. One of those, 15, 13. 14. It was me, Chance, what, Herb? Herb yeah. Was, was Herb on there? It was a lot of people. No, I think Dirk was on there. Like Kevin Gates. I'm, I'm wondering, just like, from every metric, that's at least... Eight years. I always say people in this game, I feel like you become a veteran like after like four, five. Because usually people are out of here. If you're still around, you're still even having a pulse in the game. Like you're a vet. You become a vet pretty quick. You've seen shit change. You've seen shit come and go. You've seen artists come and go. Um, what do you feel is new happening in the game? What, what do you like? Let's focus on the things, the, the mm. things you like. What do you like that's happening right now um, that may have been just like different than when you know, you first started. I love the Sonics, man. It's, it's just some amazing sounds in hip hop right now. Like that Vamp, Rage, Cardi, Destroy Lonely sound is so ill to me, you know? Mm. It's like a genre bending in a way that pulls on a lot of the same inspirations and influences that you know, I brought in and like some of those thumbed out guitar, like, yo, I love that. Like that Sonic has been really inspiring me recently. You still be playing the guitar? So what? You still be playing the guitar? Yeah, yeah, I play the guitar too. You know what I'm saying? And so like, um, I love seeing that be like more accepted. You know what I'm saying? And like seeing that be embraced. I'm gonna be honest. So, and, and, and shout out to Playboy Cardi. He, he, he had me on um, a whole lot of red too. But um, when the album came out, I liked it. I just I didn't know where it sat in hip hop. And I remember a year later, you know, sometimes we're caught up in numbers and first week numbers and stuff like that. A year later, I seen him announce he's doing like an arena tour. I'm like, what? And then I started seeing the shows, like videos of the shows. And then it's the first time I ever, you know, obviously like Kanye does some of, these, some of these things where like, you know, he brings his music to a different level when it comes to performances. Mm -hmm. I now look at a whole lot of Red by Cardi as like, th this was a performance album. This is, this is kind of like how, um, it, it's, it's kind of like, well, not in a rage form, but like, when Beyonce did Lemonade, like, and it, the album was just structured differently. You get what I mean? Because me being more of a traditional fan was having a hard time trying to wrap my head around that album and thinking where it's at and like, how does it last? Until I kind of like saw it and I'm like, mm. oh shit, this is fucking dope. And I never even knew there was like a whole different world out there because there's like, maybe I'm not like, like your fans who are probably a little bit more open. Until I see it, I usually don't think it exists. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is, I, I see why this new lane is kind of um, having like this huge growth. Yeah, that shit is infectious, man. I remember it was a festival that I was doing in maybe Sweden. And uh, on that festival bill was Pusha and Cardi. This was like some years ago. Uh, but I was seeing like, yeah, that music of Cardi's translated into a live setting. And I was like, oh, this is way different than what I expected. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? It was like, 
it's a raw energy. You know, that's something we was talking about earlier before. I feel like a lot of this generation right now, they really are ingesting music for the energy primarily. You know what I mean? That's what they're taking from it. It's like, how does this make me move? How does this make me feel? And it's a Lil Wayne interview I saw, man, where they asked him, like, how do you stay in tune with so many different generations and so many different eras of music? And how do you continue to create shit that's dope to the next crop of people? He was like, man, you got to not only listen to that shit, you got to love that shit. You know what I mean? And like really, um, really tap in and really appreciate the new music and the new sonics. You know who's another new sonic, man, that I just love. You know what I mean? Everybody's fucking with right now, though. It's Yeet sound is crazy. You know what I mean? It's yeah, I was, like I was late to the Yeet wave too, man. I'm Yeet, super late. I, Yeet, I mean, like he's fired up. Literally, I listen to music from the '70s, bro. I listen to like Marvin Gaye and the Gap Band, and you know, then old school hip hop. But but, but, but genre I, bending is is down your alley, though, right? For sure, for sure. And so I'm tapping in with that, and I'm like, yo, the Sonics they bringing into this music, like. The rolling synths, I can tell there's like some analog synth shit going on. The producer, Benny X, is crazy. He's like doing the most unexpected, just like strange sounds that come together. Then I looked into it and I'm like, let me look and see what else Benny X is producing. So I see he's producing Tizo Touchdown. Sonic is also super crazy. I see him doing records for Fouché, just like, and these are all across the board. Like the the Yeet shit is like woozy, drugged out, rave music almost. And then the Tizo Touchdown joint is almost like a pop punk record. The Fouché joint is giving me like system of a down energy. And I'm like, oh yeah, they doing something super ill over here. I'm wondering if there's going to be a new, um, or, or maybe they exist. Maybe it, it is like that 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 realm that Yeed or even Cardi is operating in Destroy Lonely. What's like? I, I look at Burner Boy or Afrobeats, and that music is so global. I feel like these days, what's winning is music that's able to translate, not just you know, mm. oh, within the inner city or locally. Like the music is just able to translate cross borders and boundaries and you know shit it it, it it fucked me up when i realized so burner boy is coming over here doing arenas like it's really hard to do an arena in the united states channel man yo honestly the music just pours through that man like i was uh i was kicking it with him in ghana one time and so he had rented this house like just off of a beautiful lake in a place called Adan and so we just all in this house studio in the house pool in the backyard the lake slash river is over there looks like a scene from a still life painting yeah. um and my cousin manifest is um one of the dopest rappers to come out of Ghana and like really just like a cornerstone of that scene um, and hip hop in Africa in general. And so he has a long standing relationship with Burner Boy and just has been collaborator and champion of him from his earliest times. And so I came there with Manifest and, you know, we stand at this house. And um, yeah, that's just, just, it's just pouring out of Burner, like it's channeling through him. And it makes sense because, you know, he's coming in this lineage of Fela Kuti. And I think his family was involved with managing Fela Kuti. I was standing up on, the mezzanine when he's down there and I hear the beat just come on and the first thing he says on the beat, he's like, kilo me, 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 I was like, yo, everybody was like, yo, this the first thing you said on the beat? Like that was the first thing that came out his mouth on the beat, you know what I mean? He didn't think about it. And I was like, oh yeah. Yeah, he, he's moving with the ancestors. The ancestors is coming through him. You know what I'm saying? Nah. Then we saw him in Ghana, actually, at the Afro Future Festival. 
I saw him perform. That was my only time seeing him perform. But uh, me and my girl went to go see him at the Afro Future Festival. Shout out to Alvin and um, Abdullah and the whole team that formerly known as Afro Cello. You might have heard it, it with that name. Now it's called Afro Future. Um, yo, Burner's performance at Afro Future, crazy. Like, really felt like fella. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I will say it was one of the only performances I've seen that could hold a candle to Kanye's stage show. Because mm. Kanye's stage show is just too beyond. And Burner's show was, it was it was right up there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I've never seen him live, but I, I've, I've watched almost any, well, any good recording of his performances online. Like, I've watched an hour-long performance Yo, of you it. You gotta see it live, bro. It was just different. The it, it, background it, singers, the band was yeah, yeah, yeah. like, Absolutely top tier. I, I watch him. He has like almost show interludes where like you know yeah. like drums come out. The singers are like ad libbing. Yeah, all type of stuff. That yeah, I, I look at that and 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 I, and I and I see just. I think that's a product of what streaming has probably done. You know, it, it's it's bringing music from everywhere to everywhere else, mm -hmm. and then it's all about you to making that connection. Um, it's all about you musically at this point. New album. Yes, sir. Where where do you feel you're at um, as an artist and, and going into this album? Um, what were you trying to get accomplished? I think the overall overarching theme of this album for me is redemption. And it's just addressing and assessing everything that's happened up to this point, you know, with honesty and with vulnerability. That's my superpower as a writer is to be brutally honest uh, about myself, about the world, about emotion, about my reality, about my dreams. And so that's all contained in this album. And coming into it, I was just, you know, sharpening my tools and sitting down and, you know, going with some of the greats and bringing in the, you know, Jay Electronica's and, Ty Dollar Signs and Cheno and you know what I mean? Just like really elevating my pen, you know, and how focusing on it. How difficult was it to make this? Because it feels like it feels it wasn't like so it, difficult. It, it, it wasn't so difficult. It's, it's it's more difficult, man, in the moment. But like for me, making music is always a labor of love, though. You mm. know, it's like I have to apply myself to it. It's not like I just jump in the studio here and there and I walk out with my best work. Like I gotta sit down and really apply myself. But you know, I was blessed to have a good team with me and this is like the first album I've done in a long time with primarily one producer. So my brother Bongo, by the way, he's a Nigerian producer actually responsible for a lot of dope shit that's in the game right now. And um, you know, we sat down and you know, we mapped it out like like a script, like a, like a movie or something, you know, with these different acts. And here's the rising of the phoenix. And this is, you know, meant to represent struggle and pain. And, you know what I mean, just really painted the picture. I see it as, as, as a movie or a painting. And just, you know, the lyrics and the words are just the colors. So we laid that outline and identified the things that we want to touch on and a lot of the topics that we talk about here, you know what I mean? Even that line that I mentioned earlier when I was like, uh, you know, be, the dead man's image, I was beefing with academics, you know what I'm saying? Um, those were really a result of having mapped out exactly what I wanted to say, how I wanted to say it. Did you, um, I had no idea you were feeling that way until I heard the freestyle. And then, you know, I kind of just went back to just kind of see what type of energy we're giving out. And I was like, this guy looked like he's 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 in a different headspace than, than I've thought him to be. Now, great, I never met you before. Well, I met you before, but I never. Not for real. Not for yeah, real. I've never, like, been around you to really Freestyle know. Freestyle is honestly, like, a lot of that type of content is what is within the album. You know what I mean? Just, like, real honesty and you know, my pro-black ideas and, you know, diasporic ideas and truth about my mistakes and, 
my aspirations and overcoming struggle. And I had to put a lot into it, you know what I mean? Because it's my last album on rock, you know what I'm saying? And like, um, obviously the What does that mean to you? That just means new chapters, you know what I mean? It's like I got the utmost love for Rock Nation always, you know what I mean? And who knows what the future holds, but this is the last album of my deal proper. Um, and so I really wanted to, as with anything I make, make sure that it's like really special, you know what I'm saying? It's just like pacing it, you know what I mean? Taking my time and like I'm approaching shit from such a new perspective right now that I see absolutely no ceilings. Like, I feel completely unlimited. I feel like I got God with me. I have my head on straight. I have clarity. I'm not worried about veering into controversy and drama that has stood in my way a lot of the time. And I just see an open runway in front of me. So I feel like this album in a lot of ways for me is like just my first step down this open runway. Sound like this is the one. You know they always say about ball players, they play the best for his contract year. <laughs> so it's contract year, you know what I mean? This, this, this is the last joint right here. So you you, you got to put up, you got to drive a nice little 50 going into free agency. See what, see what they talking about. Word up. Um, favorite song um, that you care about the most on the project? Uh, obviously the people, when they check it out, they'll, they'll go listen. Oh. Actually, give me the top three for you. Okay, my favorite songs on the album, um, probably joints I produced. I produced quite a bit on this album, too. What does that mean? Because um, that word gets thrown around a bit. Like I made the beats. Really? Yeah. Damn, I didn't know you were tapped in like that. Yeah, I've been producing probably 10 years, but I really started to take my production seriously on this album. Um, so a song called Leveling Up, where I sampled Ghanaian music, that's... One of my favorites, um, song called Strawberry Louis Vuitton that I produced, um, Thundercat on it. That's also one of my favorites. And East Side Girl with Ty. That's also one of my favorites. And so I produced on all of those. Ty really did the East Side Girl. Ty's a crazy producer. Yeah, I've seen that. You know what I mean? He's So he already had the guitar and like the bass. And I just came in with, you know, with the drums and, then had my man Ernest, shout out to Ernest and Peasy, helped me re rock it. I learned this from Ye though, you know, it's like you gotta bring in the best people to do what they do on your record. So when I'm producing a record, most of the time what I do is like I'll make the beat and then I'll bring in this guy to try That's different in a way. Tweet the drums. You know, tweet yeah, yeah, the yeah, drums, yeah. like try synths, different drops, you know. Before working with Ye, I didn't really, it was like the song is what it is, yeah, you yeah. know. But working with Ye, it's like every bar is under a microscope. It's it's like every, every drum sound, every part of the song is forensically approached. Like, is this the absolute strongest that it can be? So that's how I go into an album now. I get Malik Youssef in the building. Shout out to my big brother, Malik Youssef. He's uh, one of the primary collaborators of Kanye since College Dropout and also of me since I've come out. And, you know, we go in and we just dial in every bar and try to make every lyric as potent and powerful as it can be. And then I got to listen to people too because sometimes I want to throw some lyric out there that's unnecessarily, you know, disrespectful or something because I think it's the hardest bar, yeah, you yeah. know? And just like, just listening, man, and like listening to trusted people, you know what I mean? That was, that that that's the process of collaboration for me is like, who do you really trust and whose opinion do you respect? Then do some listening. I think a lot of artists and I don't know if Ye created that, that, that whole process of just kind of, you know, really just involving so many people in the album creation process rather than just trying to be the person that say, I'm the only genius that, that touched this, right. that, 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 that touched this pot right here. You know, um, I think it's been, it's been life changing for him and also his legacy and, and kind of, 
allowing you to get the best possible works, especially as he's going on to do many other things, you know, and sometimes these other people probably, you know, they ground him. Also, they correct stuff. They help him with stuff. They help him make stuff greater, which I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad you actually took that uh, aspect from Ye. Yo, it's like rap school when you be over there with Kanye and production school. It's like everything is workshopped, you know? What do you mean? And you might, I mean that a single verse might go through 10 hands. You know, there are, there are verses that from Donda where um, by the time it got to me, I came in near the end of the album. It had already been 10 people that like they might've thrown in one lyric here, one idea there. And it started off as just a mumble freestyle um, or beats that had been created 10 different ways to find the, the perfect one. You know, my only thing with that, I think sometimes, sometimes you can not end up on the best one. Well, well that's what I was going to say. Like, so, I, th I think Kanye sure. has like, you know, he has like a, a method about him. So he's he, like, how do you pick what idea is better than the other? I guess. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah. you're having all these, you're, you're not bringing in bums to like fucking like, Hey, let me get, no, no. Everyone's coming in. They're amazing artists. They're amazing producers. How do you kind of, is it just up to you as the person who is really the, the, the director of this ship to be like, no, no, we're going to go with this 808, like, you know, tune this way rather than mm -hmm. this right here. Or no, 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 we're not going to have the the, the 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 snare drop on, on this beat. We're going to have it, you know, it, it, is that on you or you, you listen to other minds? At a certain point, it's just taste. What do you want to convey? You know, some shit is better for sure. And that's what's not going to make it. But at a certain level, it's like, what are we trying to get across? So even in, even in Donda, like, I remember at first he played it without the drums, you know, and it was pretty much like drumless, you know, and I thought that Wait, was- Wait, you did that purposely? Well, remember he did, it was like one of the- uh, Oh, one of them early Listening joints. parties that he, one of the oh, first listening parties man. and there wasn't enough drums though, you know? And it was like, that was a taste decision, but also what he wants to convey is a certain energy so the drums had to come back in because even when like when frank did blonde i remember i listened to that and at first i was definitely like nigga where's the drums on this bitch? <laughs> but after some time you realize he had just flipped the script and it didn't need the drums you know what i mean like the value of the songs was just like their beauty whereas in donda you know, it, it's Kanye music, so it still needs, he's always performing. It still needs to have that driving force in performing. For me, deciding which versions make it on is similar, man. It's like, is this something that is intended to move people? Is it intended to make people think? Is it a combination of the two? And who are the best people to help me get there? Mm. Mm, that's dope. So, so, so the three were you said uh, level up, what? leveling up, yeah. East Side Girls and Strawberry Louis Vuitton. I think those are those are my three favorite, perhaps. But then there's a joint with me and Common too. That's one of my favorites. I love Common. I know Common's my favorite rapper, man. Always has been. I, th I think I think Finding Forever is a is a under pe people give his album B the classic um, stamp um, Finding Forever to me uh, that got that got me through college yeah, finals. Make me go listen to Finding Forever, man. yo. That got really me that, that got me through stamp. college yeah. finals. Like like late nights trying to cram. Like he was just talking to my soul and talking to my brain. It was opening my mind. That spirit of what comment brought into hip hop is something that's like very heavily represented in my album and just my music is like common will give you that music that you can listen to with whatever you're dealing with in life and it'll speak to you. Like there's so much wisdom in it. You know what I'm saying? Like he's always bringing in this, uh, yeah, it's like spirituality and wisdom into his music that you can take gems from it, you know, you quotes from it and they'll serve you and whatever your purpose is. How how easy or how difficult is it to get common on a record these days? 
when I sent Common the record, it was just like, he was like, yeah, I'll check it out. You know what I mean? Um, and if I resonate with it, I'm a rock with it. You know what I mean? I've known Common a long time. And I mean, the first time I met Common, actually, I was rapping for him at a festival, you know? And you were at, well, you were booked for the festival too, right? I was, I was, I was in high school oh. and um, I was in a band. And so he was performing the festival. I just remember like, like, yo, let me rap for you. And he's walking to the van. And so I'm like, just following after him, like trying to spit my yeah, 16 yeah, yeah, yeah. and shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And he's like, yeah, all right, that's dope. Peace. You know what I <laughs> mean? <laughs> and, um, but I appreciated that though. You know what I'm saying? It's like, that shit has taught me a lot about like whenever I can, whenever I have the opportunity to extend a moment of kindness or appreciation or give somebody the space to like express themselves, do it. You know, like I know she wasn't that happy with me the other day we went to the cookie spot in Chicago and I'm standing outside and the dude from the Insomnia Cookies is just like barring me down. Oh, you know what shit. I mean? Like he's giving me 87 bars. And like. He's trying to have his big show moment. Nah, he's yeah, he's he giving was, you everything you know, he got. He was giving me 87 bars. And he was having some bars too. And uh, what you say to him? You can't hit him with a Charles man like, nah, that ain't it. You I can't let him, hit him keep with that. rapping. No, he was he was snapping. He was just, I like I like what he was expressing. So I put it on my story and I'm just oh, I'm that's just dope. I'm just rocking with him because I'm like, I know how much it meant to me when I was in a space where I wanted to like rap for people that I looked up to and you know, maybe people in my life ain't really taking my rap seriously or whatever it is. Like that shit meant so much to me when somebody like Common would let me spit for him so if somebody ever tries to rap for me or show me love in that way like i'm gonna stop what i'm doing you know for the most part like if i can and just really like create that that moment of kindness because it might mean more to them than you know you know but yeah I, i've adopted a, a five minute policy where it's like yo listen i'm, 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 that's, I'm, a, I'm that's a I'm, big window of time i'm, I'm gonna get, <laughs> yeah, but i'm gonna give you i'm gonna give you because again you know I, I remember those moments where I came close to somebody who I looked up to, who I either wanted to be just like, or I was just inspired by them. And it means the world, just the acknowledgement. Yeah. It means the world to, to, to hear them out and at least be like, Hey, listen, keep it, keep it going. You know what I mean? Word. And mm -hmm. shit, you said it right. Like it helped you definitely helped me. There's, there's times I thought I was like, I would never, you know, even get any type of attention at all doing what I was doing. And it was people like, no, no, you're breaking ground. Keep going, keep going. And from hearing that, that from the right person, yeah, that shit could do a lot. World, to you just a couple words, man. Like, it's a kid I know, man, who's like really dope, and uh, he's he's an artist, uh, rapper, but also is writing a TV show or has written a TV show. Uh, his name's Frank Leone, and he always reminds me that like when he first met me, it was like he was living somewhere Chicago adjacent and he rapped for me. And, you know, I told him something like, this is dope, you should try that. And like, he went on to make a career out of it. You know what I'm saying? And so I just try not to overlook the impact that one small moment of kindness or attention can have on somebody that is looking for it. Mm. Um, other than music, um, for, 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 for whatever reason, I feel like, have you done acting? I have been stepping into the acting, man. You know what I mean? I actually been, I've been learning a lot from, from my big bro Omari Hardwick. Um, a lot of people know him for playing Ghost on Power, yeah. um, but you know he's just like a brilliant actor, and uh, he just came to my spirit, man, because he's actually narrating the album. And, really? Um, yeah, he's like giving me like this game and guidance that he gave me in real life. You know, when I was going through some of that shit that I spoke to you about before, um, where I got into it with the guy back in Chicago, this, that, and the third, I remember talking to Omari Hardwick and he was like telling me a story about Nipsey. And he was saying that beyond my ego, like I have to protect my gift. And so when I'm, dealing with somebody that's resonating at 
a frequency that's not where I'm trying to go, you know? He's like, you're not protecting your gift. You have to protect your gift. So I brought him in to narrate the album and just like give me game like that, you know, throughout the album. Um, but I've been studying the craft of acting, man. Like I did a lot on uh, this season of The Shy. Um, things are kind of caught up in the writer's strike right now, but it'll be out soon. And it was dope because it gave me an opportunity to like really like flex that muscle. Like I've been doing acting classes and coaching and studying the craft and appreciating the way that it strikes emotional chords. And so this season on the shot really gave me an opportunity to flex that muscle and express that shit. Yeah, I would love to see you in a role where you're, you're just like completely different than what we know you are. Word. You know what I mean? And, and, and see how that plays. I, I love seeing any time when a, a rapper that we know, it could be a rapper that's an R&B singer, but now he's playing a school teacher. You know what I mean? He's yeah, doing yeah, some yeah. different shit. And also like what I've realized too is like the talents within the arts sometimes carry on. If you're a great writer, um, it's not only probably great at writing a song, that also could be great at kind of illustrating um, a short film mm. or a movie and sometimes yeah. it, it, it goes even to your performance on stage it goes into performing in front of a camera I mean you do it already in front of a music video then it happens to be in front of a movie or a, or a TV show so right. I think that's dope man listen I'm I, I'm glad I got to have a conversation with you my nah, brother I appreciate um, you, bro. I think this was a long time coming you know I, I tell people you know, and I hope people see this and realize, man, a lot of these issues that people claim they have, or sometimes even the fans relish in at times, is like, man, ain't, if ain't nobody about to die about this shit, man, <laughs> at some point, ego should subside. And it's a good thing when they see two black men being able to say, man, this shit ain't about nothing, man. That's what it is. That's because what I was going to say. I think we as a people, we need to look to conflict resolution, you know what I mean, and recognize that. Black men bickering and beefing and fighting, killing and dying over stupid shit. It's played out, you know. I think it's a stronger move for us to learn how to put petty shit behind us. And Forgiveness. Move forward. Yep. Forgiveness, learn to ignore. Like, again, it's... Uh, I think th these are situations that show people just a different level of masculinity. You know what I mean? Like, y y you got to be a certain type of person when you could, you know, you might not have liked somebody in the past, but you're like, listen, I'm going to go sit this with this motherfucker and then we're going to go trade ideas and figure out what it is. Or, man, even forgiveness. Like, you know, um, some people will say forgiveness starts with you forgiving yourself. You know, so, you know, uh, conflict resolution sometimes misses, especially with the youth, because we see constantly, you know, people are on crash out mode constantly. And, you know, um, I, th I think sometimes even as fans, fans look at it and it's like a voyeuristic type of thing. But when you get to realize, man, we're losing some of the some of the greatest artists of our time because of shit like that. We're losing just black men who were feeding their family, who had opportunities, who um, shit just go like this these days so you know what i mean for me this had to happen Word, um, man. and and also to be honest like it's you see when i'm going to ask somebody i can't even like your music now so i'm like <laughs> listen to your music with like with my ears like now i could like now i could support you know what i mean now i could be like yo hey i, no, I like this i may not be that big of a fan of that but i could be, at least be genuine in being a fan you get what i mean um so just thank you my brother i appreciate you coming here and, and bro, you really bro, initiating you that me, um anything you need man i'm here man you know i try to you know uh build relationships with especially uh, sometimes the best relationships start out <laughs> on the worst note. I kid you not. That's real tough. You get what I mean? And, you know, uh, I always tell people this, too. Who knows? In the future, we could also have a, another disagreement. Hopefully, we, we deal with it very differently. Right. And that, that that's always that's always a point. You know what I mean? Again, at the end of the day, everybody's men. But, you know, um, man, you have a bigger call and I have a bigger call. And, um, and there's a lot of people watching to see how people how anybody's going to deal with any situation. You get what I mean? It's like schoolyard. People would be like, yo, let's see who's going. I'm telling you, man, hip hop is in a crash out mode. I'm telling you, the crash out mode. All right. Anything else you want to, you, you want to um, talk about or, or uh, promote? You should yeah, say that man, number shout again. Out to, shout out to Lena Waithe, man. You know, the shy season, uh, season six, I believe coming soon. 93 boys is in stores, man. That's the 
first black owned cannabis in Illinois. So that's mm, my really? brand. We're in pretty much every dispensary in the state. Um, and yeah, the album's on the way coming this summer. Specific date? Not specific date. But very soon, very soon, very soon. Before August. I think in August. Okay. All right. <laughs> Until we get the date, man, I'm glad to have this conversation. Um, shit, after the album's out, I would love to, for you to pull back up. You know, let's let's keep having ongoing conversations. I'm with and, it, man. Let's and, do it. And it could be conversations not only about music, about really this culture. I think, you know, uh, this thing called hip hop has provided a way for me and a way for you to help ourselves and people around us. And, um, you know, I, I'm I'm of the mind that you know everyone has you know innately good um, intentions. Not everything get executed correctly. So th those conversations, holding each other accountable, holding yourself accountable, those are always um, very necessary. So I appreciate you, my guy. Yes, sir. It's love, love. bro. Thank you for watching another episode of Off the Record Podcast. Yes. When when his album's out, if you're watching this at that time, his album will be in the description. Spotify is going to link his favorite songs as well. Um, stream it right now on Spotify. Peace.